Cinema back, another edition. How we doing out there? Good, great, great, and hey, and hey, and wonderful. Oh boy, why, why are you here? There's so much better content that you could be listening to right now. So much better executed content, better production value, and doesn't make you yawn every five seconds like this fucking show. <laughs> but don't worry, folks. The end is near. I finally have just made a decision that we're we're done here. Like this is. It's been fun. It's been real. But uh, gotta really gotta go. So. As you see on your screen, your dial, however you are choosing to unfortunately join me today, or however you are unfortunately choosing to join me. No. How would that be said? Nobody cares. Nightmare Alley. Yes, Nightmare Alley. Guillermo del Toro's most recent one just got released on HBO Max. Kind of upset that I didn't get to see this one in the theater, but... Life happens, you know, you, you got uh, you, you got a day job, you got a relationship, you have this, which is, I mean, between my day job and this, I have two full-time jobs, that's all there is to it, but I was goddamn ashamed that I couldn't make it into the theater to see this. I didn't even see some of, like, <clears throat> you know, you could make the argument that this one isn't necessarily warranted for theater going, I mean, I, I don't. Uh, agree with that, of course, but I could see how someone's like, well, you don't need to see this in the theater. If you're going to go to the theater, see something like Spider-Man or the Batman or whatever, you know, and I, and I totally, I, I, I understand that. Um, nevertheless, like I really want movies to stick around for a while. And, oh, I, t- I mean, one of the reasons that I'm quitting this podcast is because of where cinema is trending. And, you know, for good or ill, I just don't think that there is a whole lot of connection to movies like there used to be, which is fine, you know? Like, it, it's, it's, it's the way of the world. Things change. Evolution, baby, right? It's just, I, it, it bums me out only because I, I made the poor choice. Me, it's no one else's fault. I made the poor choice to make movies, you know, a hobby turned obsession. And now I look at all the hours that I have put into not only this show, but just watching movies in general. I think I looked at my letterbox the other day, and I'm over 3,000 titles that I've seen. That is a whole lot of and amongst those 3000 titles I there's so many of those that I've seen 10 15 20 times like you know I think of like jaws or no country for old men or jackie brown or something I've seen those you know a dozen times and I just sit back and I'm like man all the time that could have been spent you know just bettering yourself as opposed to sitting there like a lump and I'm not it's not to say that movies <clears throat> can't have a positive impact they do but I I just think sometimes the older you get the less you want to sit you know you want to capitalize on your time and it just took me way too long to snap out of that like I thought oh, I'm gonna I you know you you stick with your passion something good's gonna happen but you know there's nuances to that if your passion <laughs> if the if the landscape as a whole from a career aspect uh, in terms of filmmaking is dramatically changing and the the want for movies you know is just as much as the want for more YouTube hosts and subscribers you know it's just it's it's a different thing so um I go back and forth man I still wish I would have went to the theater and saw this one I'm a I'm a hypocrite uh you know I I talk about how I want move you know want to keep movies around as long as possible and then I'm one of these motherfuckers that's streaming instead of going to the theater and you know I go back and forth on that yes I should have just went to the theater flip side of that is I you know I I've I go to the theater <laughs> I've gone to the theater. I've gone to the theater to see one movie more than five times. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've paid my dues to a certain extent. It's just, you know, I, I, I got to walk the walk. You know, just can't talk the talk. Got to walk the walk. So, what is Nightmare Alley? It is a uh, a neo-noir psychological thriller film uh, written and directed by Guillermo del Toro, also written by Kim Morgan, and it's actually based on the William Lindsay Gresham novel. I'll talk about that here in a second, but Nightmare Alley stars Bradley Cooper, Kate Blanchett, Tony Collette, Willem Dafoe, Richard Jen- Jenkins, Rooney Mara, Ron Perlman, Mary Steenberg, David Straitharn, 
Uh, I mean, you got cameos of Clifton Collins, Ju- Clifton Collins Jr., Tim Blake Nelson, Jim Beaver. I mean, th- it is packed to the gills. So this one is sitting at about 80% <clears throat> on Rotten Tomatoes. I guess my... Um, My thought on it is we've come to know Guillermo as a specific type. You know, he is very much uh, in the monster world, if you will. And um, I would argue that this one is perhaps his most adult and most... Well, I don't want to say most polished. I think Shape of Water and Pan's Labyrinth are pretty... Pretty fucking polished. I, I just feel like this one is much more of a grown-up film for him. We are dealing with very realistic themes. Like you know, you could say, well, Crimson Peak was grown, yes, but it, it was a ghost story, was it not? You know, this is just dealing with the horrors of man. You know, this is this is very realistic, very crime drama based. Whereas, you know, Pan's Labyrinth, Devil's Backbone, it's the fantastical. Hellboy mimic it's it's very mythic and this it 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 feels mythic but I think at its core it is just the tale of a bad man you know and um, I think it's a very bleak film so it doesn't shock me that Guillermo signed on to do this I still want him to do at the mountains of madness you know, I I just think that that's which is an H.P. Lovecraft uh, short story. I just think that that if there was anyone that could do at the mouth of madness, give it scale and make it good, it's fucking Guillermo. So uh, this one's just it, it, again not bad, just a different path for Guillermo, and I like that in terms of showing a little bit more range. You know, I. I go back and forth again, as I've said on this show a million times, I'm a hypocrite. Like, on the one hand, keep making monster movies because that's what you're fucking awesome at. You know, I'm a toxic fan. But on the flip side of that, I also want you to also want you to go outside your boundaries a little bit. You know, I, I think uh, a prime example of that is Edgar Wright's Last Night in Soho. Like, it... Edgar Wright had a very common theme throughout his films with the humor and and then you see Last Night in Soho and it is just a complete deviation from his catalog. And Guillermo is not, you know, Nightmare Alley, it's not a complete deviation from Guillermo's catalog, but a deviation nonetheless. And I think it works. I, I, I really do. I, I think my favorite aspect of this film is definitely the set design, art direction, and cinematography. The world in which I I struggle to think in terms of originality uh, in creating a world, who is better than Guillermo del Toro? I don't think in terms of the attention to detail, like in terms of feeling like you're there, uh, I, I don't know any other directors that make me feel like that. I've had a couple cinematographers make me feel a part of the world and part of uh, part of the environment, like Richard Deacon's Blade Runner 2049, um, you know, stuff like that. But in terms of what Guillermo does, I, I just don't see anybody else <laughs> really doing it. It's at least to the level that he does, so... Um, again, Bradley Cooper is in this. I thought he did um, a really good job. Uh, definitely a different, um, just a different uh, transformation for B- Bradley Cooper. In fact, to some extent, you could make the argument that he basically is three or four people in this. And I don't mean different characters, but... When you mix the progression of the film and and kind of the 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 time lapse of it all, he's he's almost three different people, you know. Um, and I, it, for someone who really wasn't on board with the whole Bradley Cooper tra- uh, train, every time I see him now, like he just keeps getting better and better. You know, I think everybody thinks of Bradley Cooper, you know, hangover, but now, you know, or wedding crashers, I think of Bradley Cooper as a star is born, you know, like that, 
that Bradley Cooper is, <laughs> I mean, really, really fucking good. He's honing his craft. So, um, but I thought I, I thought he did good with the material in this one. Um, in fact, I go back and forth with uh, Bradley because, like. The content in which you're watching, and don't get me wrong, the transformation by the time he reaches the end, and uh, I won't ruin anything, obviously, but the transformation, I mean, is really good. But the content of the film is so dark, sometimes I go back and forth whether or not a, you know, obscenely good-looking man like Bradley Cooper um, isn't holding the product back a little bit and you know i i don't know i'm just thinking out loud because i don't script this fucking show i'm just as i'm thinking about the movie and how i felt watching it in in the tone of the movie i mean you could make the argument that bradley cooper you know now what's a prime example i would say charlie hunnam in uh crimson peak everybody knows charlie hunnam right everybody i mean they know him from sons of anarchy i know him from green street hooligans but like charlie hunnam like I, I'm not saying he's a bad actor. It's just I, he didn't fit in that film for me, and I kind of go back and forth whether or not Bradley fit in this film. I again, I I don't think it <clears throat> degraded the film. I think he's a talented as fuck actor, but because of the content, I wonder if somebody else might not have been um, a better choice. And I don't know. I don't know. I would I would want to see the like I wouldn't just say, "Oh, well this guy would do good. Bam, let's put him in there. It, it would definitely be better." I would have to be at a table read. I'd have to be at a casting call that sort of thing and <clears throat> and really see how another actor worked with the material because like I said, it is it's it's pretty bleak. So <laughs> um you have Tony Collette in this who's actually just, you know, Tony Collette is pretty much good in everything she does. I don't think she should have won an Oscar for Hereditary Horror Crowd, but I do think that she is really good um, in this. It's nice to see her warm. I, I, I feel like in the last couple films, I haven't felt her warmth. I mean, there was a couple times popped out in Hereditary, but you got to go back to kind of like Little Miss Sunshine and and stuff like that to like be like, oh, yeah, you know, because like if you think of something like Knives Out, you know, she's just she's hateable. She's hateable. The parts of Hereditary, she's hateable. You know, um, but you don't get to see the Krampus Tony Collette as much as we should. That's all. So um, she did really fucking well in this. She played uh, Zena the Seer. So the Seer. Uh, Willem Dafoe is in this. Who doesn't love Willem Dafoe? Spider-Man, Green Goblin, right? Um, what else? What is like? What is my favorite Willem Dafoe? The Lighthouse? I don't know if that's my favorite. Willem Dafoe, The Great Wall? Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a most wanted man. Oh, that's a good one. Grand Budapest Hotel. That that may be the one. That may be the one right there. Or Odd Thomas. Nobody talks about Odd Thomas with Anton Yelkin. R.I.P. God damn, I miss that boy. So fucking talented. Um, who else do we got in this? We got Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett, uh, I mean, easily one of the most talented actresses working today. And her turn in this, I mean, it shows you again why she is as good as she is. Um, you know, a very meaty and devious role she has as Dr. Lilith Ritter. Dr. Lilith Ritter. Um, yeah, just uh, name one film that fucking Kate Blanchett's been... Dude, she played Bob Dylan. That's how fucking... That's how fucking good Kate Blanchett is. She played fucking Bob Dylan. And if you've seen that film, she's really fucking good as Bob Dylan. Like, it's eerie how fucking good she is as, as Bob Dylan. Anyway, uh, Nightmare Alley is a neo-noir psychological thriller film directed by Guillermo del Toro from the screenplay by del Toro and Kim Morgan based on the 1946 novel by the same name by William Lindsay Gresham. Um, so that novel, uh, it is a study of the lowest depths of showbiz and its sleazy inhabitants. That should tell you this, like the, the tone of the movie that I was talking about. The dark, shadowy world of a second-rate carnival 
second-rate carnival filled with hustlers, scheming grifters, and Machiavellian femme fatales. Machiavellian femme fatales. Gresham attributed the origin of Nightmare Alley to, uh, Alley to conversations he had with a former carnival worker while they were both serving as volunteers with the Loyalist forces in the Spanish Civil War. Gresham wrote the novel, his first, while working as an editor for a true crime pulp magazine in New York City during the 1940s. He outlined the plot and wrote the first six chapters over a period of two years, then finished the book in four months. Each chapter is represented by a different tarot card. I wish they kind of would have did that in uh, in the movie. That would have been that would have been kia kia. That would have been pretty kia kia. Um. So, da, 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 da. Nightmare Fucking Alley. In 1939, Stanton Carlyle burns down his house, but not before. Le- the first scene that we see is Bradley Cooper drag a body into the middle of a floor of a old, you know, rickety 1940s home. And after he puts the body in the in the floor in the center of the house, he sets it on fire and then walks out of the house. So you're kind of like, what the fuck is happening here? Um, he leaves without really so much indication. He stumbles on a carnival and gets a job as a carny. <laughs> when the carnival's geek, they call him. It's it's more like the the carnival's. Uh, rabid man or feral man more than it is the geek. I don't know why they call it the geek. Um, Clem enlists stands to help him dispose of the man and explains that he seeks alcoholics who are often men with troubled pasts and lures them in with promises of a temporary job and gives them opium-laced alcohol. Willem Dafoe does. He uses their dependence to create a feral or a geek for his carnival. Stan works with the clairvoyant act Madame Zena and her alcoholic husband Pete. Oh, such a good character Pete was. Very heartbreaking in a sense. Zena and Pete use cold reading and coded language, which Pete begins to teach Stan Stan and Carlisle. He and Zena warn Stan not to use these skills to continue leading patrons on when it comes to the dead. Meanwhile, Stan becomes attracted to a fellow performer, Molly, and approaches her with an idea for a two-person act away from the carnival. Yep. And then we have a time lapse. There's a lot that happens in there. There's a lot. This film is essentially two films. I would say the first hour and 20 minutes, or first hour and 10 minutes is one film, and then the last hour and 20 minutes is another film. Two years later, Stan has successfully reinvented himself as a psychic act for the wealthy elite of Buffalo, with Molly as his assistant using Xena and Pete's techniques. During a performance, their act is interrupted by psychologist Dr. Lilith Ritter, played by Blanchett, who attempts to expose the act, but Stan bests Ritter and shows her that she's a fool. He is later approached by wealthy Judge Kimball, who employed Ritter to test Stan. So they were just trying to find out if Stan actually um, was who he says he was and could do what he says he can. Now convinced of Stan's abilities, he offers to pay him to allow him and his wife to communicate with their dead son. Despite Molly's objections, Stan agrees, and that, and thus... (laughs) begins our downward spiral into the abyss. I mean, and it just gets darker and darker. Ritter Ritter invites Stan to her office. Knowing he is a con man, she is intrigued by his skill. Through recorded sessions with her client, she has accumulated information about members of Buffalo's social elite and also uh, judges as well. She and Stan begin an affair and conspire to manipulate Kimball with Ritter providing private information to Stan, which he uses in these seances to convince, you know, these pain, these these pain people who are hurting, 
um, due to grief and you know, just basically robbing them. She begins therapy sessions with Stan, who reveals guilt over Pete. Uh, well, don't say that. But <laughs> I don't want to ruin that. Kim Kimball introduces Stan to Ezra Grindle, played by Richard Jenkins. Hateable. Hateable. Ezra Grindle, whose lover Dory has died due to a forced abortion. Despite warnings from Ritter that Grindle is dangerous, Stan begins to scam Grindle and starts to... Uh, oh, yeah, he starts to drink. That's kind of a weird thing, Wikipedia. Anyway, yeah, uh, Bradley Cooper for the first half of the film doesn't touch stuff, won't drink, can't do it. Once he starts a, an affair with uh, Ritter, a.k.a. Kate Blanchett, uh he starts drinking downward spiral in fact i mean it, they put a fine point on when he takes that first drink and you just know you just know as an audience member nothing from here on out is going to go right not to say that drinking's bad but if you made a decision your whole life and it's kept you sharp up until that point and then all of a sudden you know you decide to drink at 43 and you haven't drank it's probably i don't know i don't have any facts but it's probably not going to end well gang <laughs> It's probably not going to end well. So, yeah, he starts drinking. Ritter feeds Stan information to use against Grindle as revenge for him attacking her. Molly becomes uncomfortable in learning of the affair with Ritter. She leaves Stan. Who wouldn't? Rooney Mara, uh, who plays Molly, leaves Stan. He begs her to stay, but she refuses, only agreeing to help him one last time. So, uh, Grindle would like to talk to his dead wife, Richard Jenkins. Ezra Grindle wants to talk to his dead wife. Stan, played by Bradley Cooper, asks Molly, played by Rooney Mara, if she would stand in as Dory, the ghost of Ezra's dead wife. Yeah, man, that'd be a tall ask for <laughs> being in a relationship. That's a tall... Yeah, do you mind if you could play dead and we are playing it for real? He cannot know that you are really alive. <laughs> Uh, she poses as Dory for Stan's act, conjuring Dory from afar uh, for Grindle. However, Stan loses control of Grindle, who reveals himself to be a violent abuser of women due to his guilt for Dory. And wouldn't you know it, he, closes, he breaks free from Stan Bradley Cooper and gets a hold of Molly, who is playing... Ezra's dead wife, Dory. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing that happens to, um, you know, Pete and Xena warned. They fucking warned Stan that you cannot play with people's emotions when it comes to talking about the dead. You cannot lead them to believe that they are talking to the dead because it has consequences. It's like messing with the time-space continuum. There will be consequences. You, if you move that lamp two inches to the to the left, you could start an earthquake in fucking China. Like you know, like it, it, it literally was like that, <laughs> um, where he. You know, he he's swindling them. And part of him in the beginning, Stan, part of him in the beginning thinks he he is doing a disservice. Or he is doing a service. He's giving them hope, to which Pete and Xena, you know, basically shoot down. Like, hope is a very dangerous thing. And I'm here to tell you, folks, real life experience, yes, hope is a very dangerous thing. In fact, it just came back to bite me in the ass not too long ago it is it's you just you get consumed but oh it's if if you put in the work it's going to work out fact of the matter is you know you can hope that all you want but there's always other contributing factors ladies and gentlemen you know you can't you can't force something you know you can't even if you hope and you're and you're doing the right things guided you're doing the right things even guided by hope it's sometimes it does not end well it does not end well at all and in this story well it is no different so some of the things that um i wanted to touch on was the music by nathan uh nathan johnson actually alexander desplat was supposed to do the score but then uh for whatever reason, dropped out of the product, uh, out of the project, and uh, 
for Nathan Johnson having not done a ton of stuff, I mean, he's done some good stuff. Looper, uh, Kill the Messenger, which I think is completely underrated, uh, Knives Out, um, Brick. You know, he's got some great um, titles in his catalog. Um, part of me wonders what Alexander Desplat's uh, score would have sounded like because I'm a huge Alexander Desplat fan. Um I told you I loved the uh, the art direction and set design, yeah? Um, sh- uh, production designer uh, Tamara Deverell is who did Nightmare Alley, and it is my favorite part of this film. The sets and the environment is my favorite character in the film. Yes, I will run that back for you one time. The sets... And the environment, the world, is my favorite character in the film. It is so easy to submerge, uh, submerge yourself in that. And I, I think without Tamara at the helm, I don't know, buddy. I don't know how that would play out. I really don't. Um, art direction by Brant Gordon, who's done Nightmare Alley, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, Shazam, Molly's Game, Suicide Squad, Crimson Peak, Robocop, Total Recall, just on and on and on. And again, without that production design, set design, art direction, I think you got yourself probably not the most enjoyable movie. And then last but not least, Dan Lauston, who did the cinematography, Um, He's done the cinematography for most of Guillermo's films, or uh, a handful of Guillermo's films, Shape of Water, Crimson Peak. Uh, He's also done, or he's in post-production right now with John Wick 4. He did John Wick 3, and I can tell you right now, you're a good cinematographer if you were a part of the John Wick movies. I do not know, or I don't think that the masses know just how important that camera work is is to go with the choreography, the fight choreography, the action choreography that you're seeing. It it is next level important, and I can tell you, it can make or break a fucking film, no doubt about it. He's also done Wind Chill, Silent Hill, Darkness Falls, The Legend of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Brotherhood of the Wolf, which is one that uh, people like, Mimic, uh, Brotherhood of the Wolf, I thought was really good when I was younger, but I've watched it now and I was older, it's okay. You know, it's it's nothing fucking. It's it's not it's not what everybody says that it is. Yes, I know I'm making people upset, but uh, come on, if you're being honest with yourself, Brotherhood of the Wolf is not fucking what it's not what you fucking thought it was. I promise you. Be watch it with a more critical eye. Ellis Cinema, Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. Starring Bradley Cooper, Kate Blanchett, Tony Collette, Willem Dafoe, Richard Jenkins, Rooney Mara, Ron Perlman, Mary Steenburgen, David Strathairn. All star cast. Very bleak. Very fucking bleak. But still good. Still good. Still worth a watch. HBO Max. Come on. Get those streams in. I don't want Guillermo to think he made a bad film. He didn't. I think he just made a film that a lot of people... I just think he made a film that a lot of people are like, well, yeah, I I think it was good, but I'm not sure that I needed to see that. Because like I said, it's dark as fuck. Ellis Cinema Nightmare Alley. We're gone.